Let us pray. God, you have set before us life and death. Life is ours if we but believe in Jesus. We say we believe, but how do our lives demonstrate that belief? Help us to live as those who have eternal life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Later today, you may be watching a football game. You have probably seen signs in the stands at football games next to fans painted in uh, team colors. The signs say simply John 3.16. For folks who were raised in a certain type of church, this is a coded message that says, Believe in Jesus and you won't go to hell. For those who were not raised in that kind of church, it's kind of a puzzling thing. It communicates that the person holding the sign is religious, but not a whole lot more. Some more curious people, perhaps people who aren't really into the game, might Google John 3.16 to find out what it means. I decided that I would Google it to see what the internet says about it. My phone is so used to me typing in Bible verses that I had to go down several pages before I got to the Wikipedia article. It says, and I quote, John 3.16 is the 16th verse in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, one of four Gospels in the New Testament. It is deemed one of the most popular verses from the Bible and is a summary of one of Christianity's central doctrines. The relationship between God the Father and the Son of God, Jesus. Particularly famous among evangelical Protestants, the verse has been frequently referenced by Christian media and figures. End quotes. The page then goes on to explore different understandings of the verse. I'm always a bit leery of verses plucked out of the Bible and thrown onto signs or plaques or coffee cups or whatever. Just as none of us lives in a bubble all alone, no verse in the Bible is meant to encapsulate the whole gospel by itself. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is not simply that we will have eternal life if we believe in Jesus. It is rather that Jesus has come to bring good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to turn water into wine, to infuse our daily lives with so much life that we go around dripping the glitter of grace, mercy, and peace everywhere we go. Eternal life isn't just our reward for our life well lived. Eternal life is here. It's now. Available to us. And the gospel of Jesus is not just sit back and believe and wait for the end. The gospel of Jesus is to get up now and live this one beautiful life you have been given do something to relieve your neighbor's pain. Turn someone else's water into wine. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's start at the beginning of the passage. We started this sermon series with the very first chapter of John's Gospel. And we've gone slowly through the first two chapters. We saw Jesus change water into wine and learned that God is good. And God wants us to know joy. We saw that Jesus was able to call Nathaniel to witness to greater things than he had ever seen before. And we watched as Jesus drew back a whip and cleared the temple. Now we find Jesus in a room late in the evening. He's sitting there doing whatever Jesus did in his downtime. Maybe he was chatting with the disciples. Maybe he was repairing a hole in his robe. Maybe he was having a snack of hummus and olives. All we know for sure is that it's in the dark. And that's important. 
Remember, Jesus is the light of the world, and the people who have walked in darkness see a great light when they see Jesus. So this leader of the Jews, Nicodemus, who is probably a member of the Sanhedrin, which is kind of like the Supreme Court of the temple, comes to Jesus to try to catch a glimpse of that light. Nicodemus addresses Jesus as rabbi. It is a term of respect. Nicodemus must have caught a glimpse of something, something in Jesus. Maybe he heard about the water being turned into wine, and and maybe he was intrigued by Jesus turning over the temple tables. Nicodemus saw something in Jesus that drove him to seek him out and call him rabbi. It probably was not a sign held up at a football game with a quote. Life and life abundant isn't found by shouting our beliefs at one another. Life and life abundant is found in relationship with Jesus, in learning what it means to be born again, in changing who we are in a very deep way. Being born again is not achieving a goal. It is humbling oneself to be like a baby and having to learn how to walk in the world all over again. I've gotten ahead of myself again. Hang on. Nicodemus tells us that Jesus must be from God because no one can do the things he has done without God being with him. And Jesus replies, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I feel for Nicodemus here. Nicodemus has studied the scriptures for years He spent his life trying to live the way he was taught was righteous. He's willing to humble himself and come talk to this teacher who has no seminary degree, but does have a temper. And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. Nicodemus is like, what? Jesus tells him he has to be born of water and of spirit. And poor Nicodemus just doesn't get it. Jesus begins to explain, and he isn't nice about it. He insults Nicodemus. Then Jesus tells Nicodemus that he came from heaven and will have to be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, and that anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world. And John, the gospel writer, he doesn't tell us what Nicodemus did with this information. He just has Jesus talk a little longer and then changes scenes to John the Baptist exalting Christ. We're left sitting in Nicodemus' chair, pondering what does it mean to be born again. We're left to figure out what it means that Jesus was not sent to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. And many, many theologians and biblical scholars have spilled gallons of ink trying to explain this. Did God send Jesus to die? Or did Did Jesus die because sinful people couldn't stand love in action? Is salvation a once and done event, or is it the gradual remaking of a person? When we are born again, is it the waters of baptism that wash over us, or is it the spirit that indwells us, or is it both, or is it neither? (coughs) And after a few weeks of researching and reading, you hear all the answers. And when you come to Jesus in the depths of the night, when all seems lost and there's no point in continuing on, 
when all the questions echo in your mind and it looks like the joy of life is gone, when the money you prayed for isn't there and the one you loved has left, when there is nothing else left, that's when you run into the truth. That God so loved the world. <coughs> and it doesn't really matter how God so loved the world. We probably can't understand it anyway. What matters is that we are loved exactly as we are. We are cared for like that long-desired baby. We are the beneficiaries of God's amazing grace. We are the ones who drink the wine of joy given through the servanthood of our master. And we are called to share this joy with the world. We're meant to be born again, renewed, revitalized, transformed, and set free. We are called to live out the gospel that God so loves this world that we begin to truly love this world. <coughs> and our hearts expanded our minds blown by the enormous grace that has been poured out for us. That the one, the one who created everything, the one who sees eternity has wrapped himself in flesh and walked among us knowing that he would be killed, executed, betrayed, and humiliated, and still chose to open this pathway to the Father. The good news is not found on your deathbed. The good news is here. It's now. The good news is found in the breaking of bread and the washing of dishes and the care of the garden and the love we share with each other. Beloved, set aside all fears and all doubts. Believe that the God who created everything created you out of and for love. God came to walk among us in the person of Jesus so that we can have eternal life now. And that will change the world much more quickly than a sign reading John 3.16, for which all the world will say, thanks be to God.